Okay, Joseph. Hi, everyone. Um, so I thought um, a panel about wood treatment would be great. It's almost never talked about. Um, and yet there is a massive amount of research into the subject, not directly related to violin making. And, and I think a lot of makers are now comfortable talking about it and, and, and comfortable doing it. So I think it, 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 things always go better when we put our information together. Um, I started, um, I guess, in the summer of 1982, 83, um, a researcher called um, Gary Bass, many of you may know of him, came to Cremona where I was staying with, with Greg Alf. He was researching varnish, but he was also interested in wood treatment and possibly treating wood in hot springs and um, a lot of fun, a lot of fun trips we made. Um, the, he found um, references in, in historical documents about um, painters treating frames in wood, you know, wooden frames to stabilize them. And so, um, we settled on the idea of boiling wood and got the biggest pasta pot we could find in, in Cremona and and got going with it. Um, later, when um, Greg and I set up Curtin and Alf in Ann Arbor, we continued that and eventually got a, um, a big pot to boil in. And I just talked to, or to Greg the other day to ask if it's okay if I, I talked about that. He said it was fine. And he, he mentioned that that pot... Um, is was was later given to a um, some kind of an organization that used it for heating large amounts of food of soup. <laughs> Apparently, people brought vegetables and they made huge batches of soup. So it's it's good to know the the treatment traditions going on. Um, let me share my screen. Um, oh, While well, Joseph was doing that, um, if we could uh, hold off the questions until the end of all of the presentations, I think that would be. Um, Thank you. Thank you for reminding me. Um, fan. Um, I, I think that um, the four of us are probably going to talk a lot about the same things. So some of the questions may be answered um, naturally on the course of things. And also um, questions can really bog things down so that one presenter gets a pile more and, and crowds out the others. Um, so uh, let me try. Okay, here we go. So let me um, just talk a little bit about the um, ahead of time, the basic, the, some of the basics of wood and a little bit of the, the science behind it, because um, I think a lot of things are going to come up again and again. So let's just get them out of the way. Um, important ingredients in wood are, of course, cellulose, hemicellulose, and lignin. Um, the cellulose we're going to focus a lot on. It's one of the main um, components that produces strength. The hemicellulose too is one of the things that changes with, with thermal um, wood treatment. And lignin, I, I haven't explored much. It's the it's the a very hard solid part of wood. It's 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 not susceptible to um, um, moisture absorption so much. Um, and it's not that much affected by the kind of treatments at least I've been involved with. Now I should say um, there's a vast amount of treatment that's been proposed, everything from, I believe it or not, orange juice to um, intensive um, chemical treatments to um, microorganisms eating them out. And they all may be fine. I, I, I don't have any um, a wide knowledge of them. Um, what I've never been much introduced in, what I've never much been interested in um, is trying to figure out what the old Italians did and reproduce that. So I'm not claiming anything that I've done was used by the old Italians. And honestly, I, I don't mind either way. Um, so um, hemicellulose helps strengthen the wood by binding the cellulose microfibrils. The microfibrils are the, the, kind of the smallest units of cellulose linked together that, that, that are distributed in the wood in various ways to, to strengthen it. The hemicellulose can be extracted using hot water and it's lost naturally over time, especially with humidity cycling. Loss of hemicellulose leads to brittleness, susceptibility to cracking, but the wood becomes um, less affected by moisture. So 
Um, here is from um, Wikipedia, a little illustration where these um, blue tubes are the microfibrils and these green jags are the hemicellulose and you can see it's kind of sticking the microfibrils together. There's also other things that work them, There's, um, but we're gonna ignore them. Um, let me talk for a moment about crystalline versus amorphous. Um, molecules can be aligned in a very regular ways in a crystalline form. Polycrystalline is a bit of a bit of crystallization, but not entirely and amorphous is, is random. And these, of course, um, arrangements very much affect the the properties of a material, in particular how how strong it is. Um, this is a, a, a schematic of a, a cellulose microfibril. And we can see there's um, there's areas that are crystalline and there's areas that are not. And the main point of this is that the degree of crystallinity can change over time and or with treatment. Um, and many, many different things will change the amount of crystallinity. And let's just look at uh, um, very briefly at some of the papers that mention this. I should say there's a... Um, there, there, this this is from a a journal whose title is cellulose, so you you can imagine how much stuff there is about um, these kind of things. Um, so crystallization um, uh, um, of microfibrils in wood cell wall by repeated wet and dry treatments. So basically, um, it's a humidity cycling, and they find that the crystallinity and crystal size gradually increased with heated and unheated treatments, and the wet dry cycling promotes crystallization regardless of heating. So I remember some years back, this um, humidity cycling as a way of stabilizing wood came out. Perhaps it was a result of this paper. No, this was 2013. I think it was uh, maybe even earlier than that. Okay, so changes to the um, cellulose by heat treatment under dried and moist conditions. The heat significantly increased crystallinity of Wood cellulose, almost twice as much crystallization as spruce heated under highly moist conditions versus dry. And um, wait, hold on. Sitka spruce was heated between half hour and 16 hours at temperatures between 120 degrees and 200 centigrade in nitrogen or air. The Young's modulus, the shear modulus, the crystallinity index, and the crystallite width increased during the initial stage and decreased when the temperature was high. They treat they decreased more in air due to oxidation. So this is this is saying two things to me. One is that you can treat to improve some qualities and go further, go too far, and they'll start decreasing again. Um, and there would be if you don't want to decrease due to oxygenation, then get rid of the oxygen. Um, this was uh, um, examining the creep in wood and whether that could be improved by treatments. And samples treated at 160 degrees centigrade had improved creep performances in moist conditions. Samples treated at 175 and 190 had reduced creep performance. So again, I got creep was reduced at 160. If you, if you got it hotter, then the performance started getting worse. And this was, I think, just in um, a simple oven treatment. So um, I started off with a, um, when I started my own studio, got a 50 gallon stainless steel drum with heat blankets and some internal heaters for boiling wood. One of the problems with boiling wood is it, it takes a long time for the wood to get waterlogged and you have to hold it down, there's a basket inside and there's something that you could put wood in it and hold it down. Um, and then you have to keep replenishing it. Um, I seem to remember the schedule was about almost a month at a, just below boiling point. So it didn't boil away something like 190 degrees. Um, that would be Fahrenheit. So just under hundred centigrade. Um, and then you have to dry it. So that means another month or two with a kiln. So it's quite a complicated in practice, although it's simple in, um, um, it's simple theoretically. The um, maple um, sinks much more quickly. Um, I think it's the spruce that took almost a month. 
Um, this is a, um, a, a kiln controller. Um, it's, it's used by, for ceramics kilns and you can program the rate of rise of temperature and the, you know, the temperature that it holds and then the temperature goes down. Ramp soak is the, is the term they use for that sort of thing. And you can buy individual parts like the electronics very cheaply if you don't mind putting on the relays. This one happens to be very convenient to use and you can create different cycles and um, save them. And but it's basically a large relay that'll control your, your heater. Um, uh, recently, Alex Kern, um, who, who works with me, um, got this used lab oven. And um, I've, th I've thought a lot about lab ovens and thought of getting them several times. This I think cost him under a hundred dollars from the university property disposition. Now lab ovens, there, there's all kinds. There's um, what's called gravity convection where there's no fan. With, and that's that this kind, and there's ones with convection motors to you know distribute the heat more evenly. Um, here we have a, um, a, um, a casserole dish with water in it, and um, here is a, um, a thermometer to read the the temperature. I'll give more details about that soon. Um, so the idea being, let's just heat it up and and have the air saturated with with, with steam. And in order to replenish it, I got this plant water, it's sort of an IV drip. And the good thing about lab ovens is that they have various ports at the top so you can get into them. Um, and I, I just ordered a camp shower, which will hold five gallons of water. So you could actually um, not worry about it ever running dry in, in, in practical conditions. Um, it, yeah, it's extraordinary the, the, the cost of electronics being so low for about $25, there's this, um, temperature um, or a thermometer basically there's four probes stainless steel probes on long wires you can stick them into your barbecue which is what it's intended for and see the temperature at different points and it'll record them all and send them to your phone and apparently make graphs so um, though we haven't done it yet um, we want to drill a hole in some wood samples and put probes inside and then measure the air outside and um, see how quickly the temperature is rising inside the wood um, so the, one of the first things to test with something like this is how even the heat distribution is. So Alex cut up a bunch of pieces and distributed them around. Um, and um, this was before, and this was, um, I think maybe 12 hours later. Um, I, I can't read the top of the screen right now. Um, yeah. and, and what we found was that it was pretty good, except there's a hot spot here and a little bit. So near the bottom, especially in the corner, there was a hot spot. Um, so if we just avoided that, it was fine. I think that probably putting a little fan in or somehow getting the air moving would get rid of that. Um, this was a, a piece of maple on top is untreated. Underneath is 18 hours at 150 degrees centigrade. And that's about as much as I'd want to do. It, you can go darker. Um, let me say that for me, the main thing about wood treatment isn't so much trying to get the material properties better. I'm glad for any benefits it has. It does tend to reduce the density a little bit. It'll improve the, the speed of sound a little bit. Um, it might make it more resistant to creep, I don't know. Um, but it sure is easy under a varnish, um, especially with top wood. Um, here is a, um, I think it's, does it say 20 hours at 150 with spruce. Um, so the great thing about this compared with um, um, boiling is you can um, quite literally go from um, completely unseasoned, almost raw wood. Um, because of the 100% humidity inside, it doesn't tend to check very much or, or at all really. Um, and um, and you know a, a day or two later you have wood that's pretty much ready to join. Um, uh, it, it's it's very liberating that way. I, I I really don't care anymore how old the wood I get is, and um, I, I, I that's I'm quite liberating. Um, here is a lab oven I'm I'm looking at if I if I buy one myself. Um, one of the least expensive one. It's twelve hundred dollars, which is a chunk of money. Um, but you you don't want to do this in your house. You know, there's a lot of kind of smells come out of it. 
Um, this, you know, I'd put outside under cover. There's venting holes in the top here so you can get your thermometers in or your water drip in. Basic control down there is all you need. Um, a lot of processes involve gradually building the temperature up and that seems worth doing, holding for a certain time and then gradually decreasing it. I think the thicker the wood is, the more important it is to be careful that way because of checking. Um, but so far, um, um, it, it looks very promising and it's it's certainly better than what 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 I was doing before with um, that stainless steel barrel with heaters in it and a pot of water. Um, the heat distribution was very uneven there, so it was hard to control and you get um, you know hot spots unpredictably and it was easy to to ruin a piece of wood. So I will leave it at that and turn it over next to um, Paul. Okay. Hello again, everyone. I'm going to just share my screen so you have some pictures. Uh, where is it here? Okay. So, um, uh, I've been doing some some. Um, uh, I've been doing some uh, some some treatments since since I started violin making almost. So the first thing I was thinking was, as you see on the picture, uh, I was thinking uh, in the time they were they were they were um, uh, using the river to 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 move the wood around. Uh, so it might be interesting to to try to clean the cells. Of the wood, uh, so the, the first experiment I did was just putting uh, the wood in a big barrel of waters, uh, and um, and keeping like uh, like Joseph said, keeping it until uh, the wood sunk into the, the so the water would go really through. Sorry. Uh, the Joe Joseph, your screen is you. You're still sharing screen. So could you stop share? Because we can't I, see the. I, I thought I had, and I'm certainly seeing Paul's screen. Is anyone else seeing okay. my screen? No, I see Paul's screen. I see Paul's screen. Yeah, we how see. I see Paul's screen. How strange. Hmm. Um, hmm. Okay, so. So I started to do to do this. Um, I did that for for almost eight years. So it was like in my process of making, I was putting the new pieces I had. I put them in a big chunk of water, uh, let them for I had to let them for at least eight months, nine months until until the pieces were sink, sinking, uh, and then I was letting them dry uh, for a uh, for few weeks. Um, and for this, I get I get a problem was the the problem with uh, fungus. You could if 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 something goes wrong, if there is some parasite going into the water or whatever, uh, that's the type of things you can get. So uh, I was trying to get some nice piece of wood, and you see what you get. You get uh, wood with big marks, and that's that's not usable. So I had some problem with this. Uh, and I also also I'm I'm always taking the the density and the weight of the of the wood, and um, this treatment uh, made the weight going a little bit down for four or five percent, uh, which was quite interesting. But the color was not really interesting for varnishing. It was uh, more grayish. Uh, it was a little bit in this direction, but not as much of this, of course. But um, but not really interesting for for varnishing. So uh, I also try, like uh, like uh, J uh, Joseph, I try boiling wood, um, a little bit the same principle, uh, putting in water, um, boil it until it uh, sank, um, and then I had uh, I had some bad experiences. Also, the color was not really interesting; it was also a little bit grayish, I think, 
uh, and also I had some bad experiences like this one, <laughs> where uh, you could see that the 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 self of the of the wood were really getting uh, shrunk. You know, uh, that's the same. It's like okay, uh, garbage wood. Uh, so I also try in this kind of um, of uh, putting putting wood uh, in in liquid. I I, I thought. Uh, I saw once uh, the the you all know it, this violin. I guess it's the Ole Bull del Jesu, and I saw the Ole, the, the 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 real instrument in in Norway. And after I saw it in France in a, in a concert, uh, and it was really uh, it's quite a, an unusual uh, Cremonese instrument as it's this quite greenish color, uh, gray greenish a little bit the ground coat. Uh, so I was thinking uh, the, the Ober factory of bridges uh, were using for a while, uh, uh, we said that they were using ammonia for the treatment of the bridges. Uh, so I said, oh, let's, let's try with violins. So I put some pieces of wood in ammonia. Uh, and again, uh, I get some... Um, uh not really interesting result uh as the wood become a little bit like cardboard it become really weak uh the color is in the greenish direction uh but also it's it's it goes into the wood and um uh, uh make the fiber a little bit uh, shrink you know so i got example here you see the wood uh, treated with ammonia the color is also grayish, not super attractive. Uh, and also this, you see the structure of the wood uh, in the center. It's, it's, uh, it even makes some cracks, you know, in the center. Uh, so that was with ammonia. This is a, a back with ammonia too, uh, which is uh, the color not really interesting. And, and also the, the, the feeling, the, Feeling that the wood is not ringing as well as it was ringing before the treatment, you know, so it's it's not benefic for the sound, I think. Uh, and this is a piece also with ammonia, with uh, with a normal piece next to it, uh, and this one had the really big cracks, so it could uh, really affect the structure of the wood. After that, is that, I, I, is that gas ammonia or liquid? No, no, liquid. It was. Uh, uh, um, like a uh, liquid, liquid, it was a bunch of, uh, and I dropped it a little bit like uh, the boiling things, you know, you put it under and I let it for a month. Yeah. yeah. I think that's a really bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, George. You should have <laughs> told me before. <laughs> I would have done. <laughs> um, then I, I started with the heat uh, treatment of wood. So, uh, so I experiment different things. The first things I experiment was uh, dry oven. So basically putting some wood in oven and I try, I did some tests like you did Joseph, uh, small pieces, different temperature, different time. Um, then I end up um, putting my wood at around 170, 180 degrees. I thought it was more interesting uh, degree Celsius. The most interesting uh, colors I could get uh, for a few hours. And um, the big problem of this treatment, okay, the positive things it was the wood was much lighter. A lot of humidity went, went away. Uh, it went uh, like 10% lighter, so which is really good. Uh, but the big problem is also the fragility of the wood. The, the wood became much more brittle and uh, and it's also hard to work uh, because the cut is not as clean, um, and and um, and there is a big risk of of breaking, simply. Uh, then after that, so that's a type of, of, of color you can you can get. That was uh, seventy three degrees, you know, one hundred seventy three degrees. Uh, so after that, I I, I heard about something. Uh, I don't know if you have this in, in, in America, but it's, it's a treatment that's used for uh, boards and uh, flooring. It's kind of industrial uh, oven with an uh, inert atmosphere. So they, they control the, the atmosphere inside and um, 
uh, they have big, it's a big uh, oven, so the ventilation is good and the circulation of air is, is good inside. I guess they, they have a good control of uh, temperature and, and evenness of temperature. So that's the, the treatment I, I'm doing now. I, I did after the simple oven, because simple oven, the problem with a small oven, uh, you could have uh, some pieces, some part of the pieces is a little bit burned and for most of us, uh, not as much temperature is not even in the in the oven. So this this is, um, I think it's, it, it, it made the wood a little bit sta more stable. And the color is quite interesting also. Uh, and uh, same thing, same thing than a dry oven. It's like you you lose ten percent something of of uh, of weight, which is quite interesting. But sometimes you get things like that happening. That's coming from this uh, this uh, re retifive uh, oven. Uh, that was that's the same piece. That was a beautiful split spruce, one of my best pieces. And then it came back like that, you know, with big big cracks. So that's not usable. Uh, and then I heard about something. It's uh, the autoclave treated wood. That means that it's a pressure and heat treatment. That means it's like a, a pressure cooker that you get at home. So it's the same thing, but uh, you put your piece of wood inside, you put a little bit of water, and uh, the, the pressure is getting up. So, so the water is really getting through the the wood so i've been talking about this this uh, treatment it's it's used mainly for um uh for food industry uh and pharmacy i think uh so i i talked with about this this treatment with some friends in romania and uh romanian people they they're like okay we have to make the machine so they decide to 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 make a machine and they make a beautiful thing for cello which is this beautiful machine. It's huge. It's very, you know, it's a kind of industrial thing, very, very strong. And so you can put inside uh, pieces of cellos and uh, pieces of violins. So we were very excited about this, this uh, treatment because the temperature um, is not as high. You can get good results uh, only going to 130 degrees Celsius instead of the 170 and you get quite similar uh, colors so we i've been experimenting with this the wood from this this uh, treatment but i found it um, uh, the color not right it's a little bit it looks it looks nice but it's a little bit greenish and when you start varnishing instrument uh, after working with this this wood it's um, uh, it's difficult to get a natural look that you get on 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 nice instruments. So you always have to work with with different uh, things, and it doesn't work so well as as a regular uh, oven heater. Um, and um, uh, the the wood, I was I would think the wood would not be as, as fragile as with a uh, dry oven. But in fact, I had some problem also, it, it started to cracks and, and things. So it, it's not also a solution. Uh, uh, and the loss of weight is not so much important on this because you don't go so high in temperature. Uh, it's only two or three percent of, uh, of weight uh, lost. Uh, but I will show you, a fr my friend in Romania, made two oh that's that was one on the one of the treatment into the the autoclave uh you see the necks uh that was a series of necks and they all went like that so it's like terrible lost and temperature is not so high it's 130 degrees uh but there is some kind of chemicals going on uh with this treatment that doesn't uh the, the wood seems not to like it uh also you get uh, it's it's not as dry as um as uh, oven uh, baked wood uh it's still a little bit wet don't know why uh 
so actually George suggests me to I think some that's something he does to put it in a dry oven after this treatment so it's something that I do but still I'm not really satisfied with this and you put it in a dry oven at uh, 110 degrees Celsius not not so high just to dry again the wood uh, and uh, and my friend in Romania did an experiment it was quite nice he did two instruments one treated with uh, so the autoclave 135 30 degrees so that's on the left so you see it's a little bit more gray than the one on the right and the one on the right is uh, is uh, traditional uh, baked wood so um, you see the difference of, of of colors and it's so the left one is more difficult to to work with you know uh, while varnishing and the table this is a uh, baked one and this is uh, autoclave one uh, and then to finish i show you that's one of uh, one of my uh, instruments the back of uh, viola damage a few years ago and on this piece of wood, everything went fine, you know, no problem. Uh, and the color is quite nice and it's, you know, easy to varnish. That was, that was a, a wood that was baked at uh, 170 degrees, I think. And it's, it went on perfectly. Uh, so I, to, to, to finish, I would say, in my experience, I noticed that, um, uh, what is important is to choose a, at start when you start a treatment same thing than when you start to make an instrument you have to choose a, a good piece of wood uh, that means that if you have for example a piece with small cracks you know some sometimes you, you get a wood and you know, there are some small cracks if you do any kind of treatment that i've been talking about you can be almost sure that you will have trouble after you know uh, you will have big cracks or you will have a, some wood a little bit fragile uh, also if you have some twist or some uh, some um, some things that goes wrong with 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 the wood uh, the treatment will won't make the things better well, they 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 more tendency to make things worse you know um, and i notice if I, I have to be really careful about the wood i'm using i treat it before starting to treat it uh, and when I have a good piece that is, it was cut at the right time, it's perfectly cut, then usually it goes out good and I can make a decent instrument out of it. So if you want to experiment, uh, be gentle and use good wood. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Paul. Oh, okay. Okay. Did you say how long you baked that piece for? Uh, it's usually oh, this was was uh, baked in uh, in the industrial oven, so it was uh, usually they go very slow in temperature, and then they go down. Uh, so it's on on twelve hours or something, and okay, it that's... stay at it stay at one hundred seventy for like uh, two or three hours, I think. But it takes like six or seven hours to go down, you know. Super. Thank you so much. Um, should welcome. we get straight? Should we get straight to Don? Okay. Let me experiment with sharing screen. See if this works. Oh, let's see. So the window on application. There. Okay. See if I can do a slideshow. All right, so some of this has already been covered. So um, just a background is that uh, when I started looking into this, oh, maybe 12 or 13 years ago, I was interested in the properties of the wood, the speed of sound, density, and all that, and damping. So I looked around on the research to see what looked like the best thing to do. And it was a, a, called a Plato process, a version of hydrothermal processing. So I started doing that right away. 
I didn't do boiling wood or baking dry or any of that stuff. So I went straight into the pressurized steam stuff. Anyway, uh, so with the hydrothermal processing, everything changes basically weight, density, speed of sound. It shrinks, the EMC goes down, which I'll show later. And although I haven't measured the absolute strength, it's, it seems pretty obvious that it's splitty and a little bit more delicate to work with. Uh, the damping goes down, the color, of course, you've seen is brown. The only thing that doesn't change much is the longitudinal dimension, especially with spruce. It's extremely stable. If you've got highly figured maple, maybe it'll shrink a fraction of a millimeter, maybe a millimeter at the most. So what I do is uh, I'm not really into the industrial processing and equipment. So I got a small insulated chamber. I first started with a five gallon pressure paint pot and I've moved up to a 10 gallon pressure paint pot, which cost me all of $35. The tough part was uh, getting a seal that could take the temperature. So I had to take out the original seal and pour my own seal of the appropriate material. And uh, I have very low power thermal strips on it. So it heats very, very slowly. It takes hours to heat up. So what I do is I start with vacuum and then seal it off and the, then start heating and the chamber will self pressurize just due to the water that's in the wood itself. And I even need to bleed off some of the steam because it gets too high of a pressure. Don, we're still seeing your first slide. Are we supposed oh, yeah? to be seeing something else? We're seeing your presenter view rather than the slideshow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. huh. Well, I don't know how to fix that. Uh, Stop me... sharing, share yeah. again, and just share your desktop. Okay. Then we'll get a mirror of whatever you're seeing, and then the slideshow should work. Is is it changing now? No, no, it's changing when you do that. Yeah, that's another possibility. Okay, I'll just do with that. That'll be faster. Okay. Um, where was I? Okay, so after I do the uh, process with the pressurized steam, I vent it out and go to vacuum which is uh, the vacuum pumps really don't like that, but I make it deal with it. And then I keep it at high temperature during the vacuum bake. Then after that, I slowly cool down to ambient. And then my complete cycle takes six or seven days. The uh, maple is a little bit cooler and shorter. These are some results of spruce of the pieces of wood that I have tested before and after. You can see this constellation of before and this constellation of after, and it basically moves up at a diagonal, lower density, higher speed of sound. And they both change about 5%. The average is a little over 5% reduction in density and increase in speed of sound. Uh, if you want to calculate radiation ratio and look at damping, which I do, have these plots here, and the radiation ratio changes just under 10%. The big change is the average damping. Get about almost 25% reduction in damping. That's the largest percentage change in the material properties. And so with the higher stiffness and lower density, you could go to lighter plates if you want the same modal frequencies, theoretically louder, but also theoretically only a small fraction of a dB. The natural variations in the wood are much bigger than that. So selecting wood matters more, at least in these numbers. 
um, damping. It's not clear what the effect is. I haven't uh, got a really highly measured spectral difference in the assembled instrument, but uh, the varnish, glue, and all that stuff add a lot of damping anyway. The, the wood itself damping is extremely low, and when you put varnish on it, it makes a big change. But it still might add some to the uh, sound output. And other effects uh, harder to measure, especially for me that I don't have a calibrated uh, rig to measure it accurately and compare. But uh, could be transients or sustain. And there could be frequency dependent effects too that affect the tone. In my experience, it seems to me, I've, I've only built three or four violins that were not processed, but it seems that the, uh, the natural wood ones seem a little more muted than the processed wood, more unmuted and lively and bright. And that's right off the bench. You don't have to wait for years for something to happen. But also I expect that with, uh, with it coming off of the bench, kind of like an old instrument, it's not gonna change as much. There are some settling in and aging effects that you get even with the processed wood that you can't get old varnish on it. And there's also the uh, initial string set up and settling that still goes on. Don, some people are wondering how you measured the damping. Oh, um, counting the cycles on a tap tone of a, a wedge of wood. And it uh, you can do the math to calculate how many cycles it takes to drop to half amplitude. So I hold it up to a microphone and bop it and record it and see how many cycles it takes for the amplitude to decrease by 50%. Thank you. So these are some measurements of the equilibrium moisture content of processed wood versus natural wood. So for these are for maple and you see the processed wood is definitely lower EMC. Same thing for spruce. They're both about 40% reduction in the EMC compared to normal wood. One thing that I found interesting was the, uh, I had two samples of spruce that were 300 years old from Melvin Goldsmith. And they didn't look any different than normal wood. The EMC was about the same. Now, I'm not sure if that was due to the effect that it was cut from a building beam rather than carved and then aged for 300 years. Have no way of knowing. Now with the lower EMC, it also shrinks less. So the, these are the change in dimensions from ambient, which I guess was about 60% relative humidity at the time to being dead dry after bake out in the oven. And it, it pretty much follows the EMC level that you can look at these if you want that the, the longitudinal, of course, is almost negligible, so I didn't plot that, but the, uh, the radial and tangential directions are quite significant. And of course, this we've seen before, unprocessed to heavily processed. Now, one thing that was interesting is that the 300-year-old spruce from Melvin Goldsmith was not opaque. It looked pretty much like the translucency of maybe not fresh wood, but you know, would have been aged a few years at least. One thing that uh, me and John Hart and I had been looking into 
was some of the optical properties of the processed wood. And to my way of thinking, the darkness of the wood will attenuate the wood, or attenuate the light that penetrates in, gets diffused and come back, comes back out. So you can see on this processed wood, these surface reflections are quite contrasting to the background brown. But with the fresh wood, you know, the the background glow, as it was, is bright and it kind of obscures the surface reflections. Mm -hmm. So these are some results. This was my 2014 VSA instrument. And this is by somebody we all know. I wish it was mine, but this is also processed wood. One thing I observe is that the wood will look dark brown. And then when you put varnish on it, it seems to light up. Yes. So who, who is the one we all know? Uh, I don't know if he wants me to tell who it is or not. Oh, okay. That, He's fine. here. He can mention it later if he wants to. That's fine, Don. <laughs> okay. That's good, Don. I, I made it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right, wait, come on, finger. So, so with processing, there's things that are maybe positive and negative, and each maker has to decide what they what they want. What I think are positive things is stiffness, lower weight, uh, stiffness to weight ratio, lower damping, longer ring, definitely reduced EMC and dimensional uh, greater dimensional st stability. And if you're worried about fungus and mold, and it's, that's what the process was originally developed for, was to, for uh, environmental resistance. It's darker and opaque, like more wood. And on the minus side, it's kind of brittle, harder to work. Definitely you want to uh, not process the maple ribs too much because they get really hard to bend. And it's more accidental damage prone. It's more, uh, if you hit it, it's not so susceptible to shrinkage cracks because it doesn't shrink. But if you hit it, it could crack. And some people don't like how dark it is. They like the lighter wood and then do something with it. So that is what I have. Thank you, Don. Thank you very sure. much. Let's move on to George. Oh, let's see, stop share. George, can you un unmute yourself? George? Yeah, I thought I'd unmuted. Okay, we can hear you now. Yeah. So, um, there we go. How's that? Yep, looks good. All right, then. It's, it's a bit of a slipshod presentation. I haven't really put a lot of work into it. So what well, this is in the in the wrong order actually I've always I've always been doing humidity cycling right from the first instruments I ever made and the reason for that is I used to make wooden bowls on a lathe and I found that however old the piece of wood you worked if you turned it into a wooden bowl it would be oval in a few days but the the trick is to rough turn it um, a bit thicker than it will be finished let it let it hang around for a while in hot and dry places, and then turn it. Then it doesn't change shape. So I always find it really annoying if you start working on a plate and the edges curl up or something or other. I like I want that bottom to stay flat all, all through the making process. But uh, I started out with the with a boiling or stewing um, 
method. And the, the, the thing that got me started, there was a guy called Reg Lawrence, who used to work for Northern Renaissance Instruments, making the varnish. And he started experimenting with boiling wood in, uh, he said that it was done in order for the wood panels that people painted on. So a lot of paintings in, in the, um, back in the Renaissance weren't on canvas, they were on wood panels, and they were installed at a little distance away from a wall. So the stability of that wood was important. And his idea was that the, if you um, boil, uh, you boil water, uh, dissolved carbon dioxide leaves and the pH goes higher. And that's not a good thing because uh, although a high or low pH also helps with hydrolyzing um, hemicellulose, it can, a high pH could damage lignin. So the, the last thing we want to do is damage the lignin. We're, we're fine losing a bit of hemicellulose. So that's a big a spectrum of uh, um, carbohydrates. Some are barely sort of sugars or starches and some are almost cellulose. And the lower molecular stuff is, is more disposable. Um, that's okay. So in the case of uh, maple, some of that will just wash out with water. Not, not really so with um, spruce. So the, the, the way to adjust the pH is, is really just to add a few drops of something like hydrochloric acid or, um, or acetic acid. Those are probably the safest ones to use. Get the pH to a uh, starting point, get it down to about five or five and a half. Uh, and that is, is better. Now, I didn't really like boiling it. Um, but for one reason, you've got to cope with the steam. There's a load of steam is going to come off and you're going to have to deal, get, conduct it somewhere out, get rid of it. Uh, <clears throat> and then you're going to run out of water and you're topping up. So I, I thought it was a, a better idea to do it for a longer period of time at about 80, 80 centigrade, 80 Celsius. Now, I did that for quite a long time until I came uh, I, I tried all kinds of things like adding chemicals. I mean, one, one of my experiments was adding uh, salt to make it uh, the same um, concentration as seawater. It seemed to be all right. But then later I found instruments. Uh, somebody had opened the case and found a sort of crack had popped up, you know, the length of the base bar. Uh, so I think wood has a number of weak points in it, like the cracks don't just appear randomly. The places in the wood where it is for some reason or the way the tree grew, it's weaker in that um, radial direction. Uh, I've got other evidence of that. But anyway, then I moved on to pressure steaming. Uh, and I've also used a certain, uh, dry baking, but on a rather lower level, rather more to a follow up than an aqueous treatment. Um, then I moved on to vented steam oven, which we'll come to in a minute. Now, uh, one of the people I've been talking to, and some of you may know, uh, Giacomo Goli, who uh, um, works for the University of Florence, for Firenze, Italy, uh, and he, he's taken an interest in this, and he's had some students do research. And he, he's of the opinion that actually aqueous treatments are, have a lasting effect on the wood, whereas dry heat treatments don't. Now, that's a bit difficult to fully uh, believe because uh, clearly uh, when you've heat you know dry heated piece of wood and it's gone brown well that doesn't fade away that, that doesn't reverse but perhaps some of the um, well certainly some of the lo loss of weight will reverse I mean if you weigh the stuff immediately after it's been in a dry oven sure you will have lost a, a lot of humidity but that will come back after a, a couple of weeks so I don't know. I'm, uh, the, for me, the jury's a bit out on that. Uh, so why bother, blah, blah, blah. I don't think I need to um, go through all of this. So I um, would say that we should always remember that trying to modify wood does carry risks. So anything that you do, you've got to be, be careful. Uh, the one problem with wood is it's already a, a rather special material and a, a lot of other um, types of treatments that involve adding things to it, uh, they may make it stiffer and harden the surface, 
but they also increase the density. So you it's like pissing into the wind, isn't it? You gain one hand and then you lose lose with the other. So um, I don't know. I mean, you, you have to add some varnish anyway. So, so it's the stewing, yeah. So it will stuff will just wash out of uh, um, maple just in uh, cold water, given some time. It's safer to do it in hot water because then the fungus won't grow. And I've, I've covered that. Uh, I've covered that. My process lasted about four to six weeks, uh, and then I got to dry it after that. But I, I'm I'm inclined to be a little bit cautious, not not to be too greedy with the effects. So that was what my stewing tank looked like. It's it's big enough to get a, a base uh, plate in it, well a, a half a base plate. You know, like one that joins down the middle, not a, a one piece back. Um, so I had it made uh, a company that specialises in equipment for electroplating. So it's um, it's. Uh, E316 uh, stainless steel, pretty inert to everything, and there's a heating element in the bottom. But now I've um, I've repurposed it. We'll come back. And this is my um, autoclave that uh, I, I made in China, but unfortunately, that it's they're not big enough. They're not long enough. But first, you, you can see that. Uh, there's a load of stuff inside, like kind of buckets and things. Little, um, you probably don't see my mouse, do you? Little thing to keep it, it away from the, the heating element. And here you have pressure safety valves and pressure release. And basically, it doesn't matter really whether you read the temperature or the pressure, because the two are inevitably linked together. And on, on the picture on the right, you can see how, how I extended the length. So you, you have to have a good welder to do that. Um, it's, a, it's called a TIG, a TIG welder that can reach, uh, it's got long arms that can reach inside objects. So it's not so likely that the thing will just burst, but it's uh, but it's more likely that you get a jet of steam or somewhere from a bit where there's a, fa a fail bit. But there's no problems like that on mine. There's always a problem though with, with the autoclave. That the bigger they get, the the more dangerous they get. The more they've got to be very strongly built, like the Romanian one, because uh, if if the lid flew off, for example, if that hit you it wouldn't be nice. Yeah. Um, and I think in the USA, you have to have a permit to have autoclaves above a certain size because of the, of the associated danger. But I don't think one like this is very dangerous. But I still prefer not to have it right next to me all day. So my, my cycle in this uh, is about uh, about six hours. So that's uh, in a kind of I could do it for longer now, but one of the reasons for that was that could fit in a working day. So if I've got a, a kind of rise time for the temperature, then a bit careful in the de decompression, because you can burst cells if you decompress too fast. So I'd, uh, I'd, it would take like maybe half an hour, 40 minutes to get up to pressure. Then I'd, I'd like uh, take 40 minutes to an hour to decompress at the end. So, but I'd have a retention time of say about six hours. Is there a thermostat there that keeps it at the peak temperature? Uh, I use, um, um, I have a, a collection of variacs that were liberated from a metallurgy department at Manchester University. So they can change the current to uh, whatever you want from zero to the maximum. Well, you're controlling the voltage, but of course that's affecting the current that goes through the heater. Then I use a, um, a thermocouple and a, and a meter to read off the temperature. So you just supervise it so that it doesn't get too- Well, I don't, for, I don't need to for, actually I don't need to do that. Uh, I only need the, uh, the variac 
uh, for the autoclave because what what I don't want is something with a, a switching type thermostat because then you'll be reaching the point where you blow the pressure pressure valve and then it takes a while to stop that happening it's got to come down in temperature or lose some pressure you may have to manually put it back uh, whereas if you if you set the um, what's the saying the variac just right you can have it just below that point where it uh, triggers the valve and that will take you about to about 132 uh, celsius but moving on um, when i found out about the uh, the yamaha patent i thought this sounds like a better idea so um, you see here it's got a a number if you Google it, you'll find you can download a, a free PDF with all the information. And there's a, quite a bit of information in it, in fact. I mean, considering that they were patenting it because it's an industrial process that they were wanting to use on their own instruments. Um, so that the claims are reduced damping, reduced density, increase in elastic modulus, residual strains re reduced. Now, that's not unimportant, I think. And it's cheaper and better for the environment than uh, adding lots of chemicals. In actual fact, it, there is a chemical process involved here because when you heat wood, there's uh, something that in the old old textbooks used to call pyrolignic acid, which actually contains uh, acetic acid, formic acid, and maybe I think some acetone and a bit of this and a bit of that. Now that uh, acetic acid is then a catalyst for the uh, degradation of the hemicellulose. Yet uh, some of that then remains in, in the wood at the end of the process. We'll get onto that in a minute. But let's look at these. I mean, the, this is a typical uh, schedule graph. So there's a, a, there's a rise time, a retention time, then a, a, depress a depressuring time and then you can open up your autoclave do whatever you're going to do next so the the they're rather keen on high temperatures for short periods of time i think it's safer to do lower temperatures for longer so that's this is their claim for changes in damping now the interesting thing here is to see that you can actually pass an optimum point so putting it in there for hours and hours would appear not to be a good idea because actually um, the damping will go up again after a while. Uh, and this is one, uh, uh, again, um, loss of damping compared to temperature. Similarly, that there's, a, there's an optimum. So I would say like this is, says don't exceed 170 or 175. I've been advised uh, actually not to exceed 150 for any wood treatment, but I don't know whether that's good advice or not. Uh, this is a claim for increase in elastic modulus. And again, the same thing to go to do it for too long and you start, it starts to decrease again. So I'd rather be I'd rather be on the slope up to the up to the optimum than the other side of it, because some of these things will happen anyway with time on the instrument. But it, from this information, it's pretty hard to work out what's an optimum time length. Uh, yeah, the same thing for temperature. And this is a, an example. There's several charts like this. You really need to read the text to understand exactly what they're showing. Um, but it, this is showing basically a reduction in density for all of these treatments, but some, some appear to be a bit better than others. So in summary, the degree of treatment, it, it actually can be estimated by the color change and it, it, what the amount of treatment it gets it depends on the size of the piece of wood, the temperature, uh, pressure. Well, if it's steam, the temperature and pressure are one and, essentially one and the same thing, then the duration of the treatment. So a short time at a high temperature is equivalent to a long time at a short pre pressure. But by how much, uh, it's rather difficult to 
work that out. Um, I think uh, at one time I did put my mind to that for a bit, and that's probably how I came up with what I do. I've also done a dry baking, but mostly people say don't. The, the problem with dry baking is there's much more risk of damaging the lignin, which will oxidize. Um, but uh, from what you guys are saying, that it doesn't really seem to be such a problem. I mean, there seem to be a lot of benefits, even if this, even if that is true. So, and I said, I have been, it has been suggested to me that the positive effects may be time reversible. Um, so anything, anything that's approach, even approaches 100 C will dehydrate the wood. And that, that will actually improve stability. That's part of a humidity cycling uh, experience for the wood. Um, so, yeah, the, you get you get some color. The color can be obviously good from uh, a good bake. Uh, you lose some hel hemicellulose. It can actually be done in an ordinary sort of kitchen fan oven. I have a nice um, a not AEG. It's a Neff oven. It's quite expensive, but it's big enough to put in a say a viola blank, and it's um, controllable to very very, very fine temperature control. And uh, mostly I've used that following uh, a water-based treatment. I, I, this, um, where I don't think I did it actually after um, stewing, but I have done it. I normally do it after um, the autoclave. That is until I got to the vented steam oven. Now, there are um, a number of good things about this vented steam oven is that you don't have that upper temperature limit that you have with the autoclave. There's no upper limit to how hot you can make superheat steam. But I still, I still don't exceed 150. Um, I think it's better for big pieces of wood, like if you want to treat cello blanks, I think the, the autoclave risks more, too much surface treatment and not enough in the middle. So I would recommend a vented steam oven at um, you know for a longer period of time and the other thing that happens is that the volatiles that are that are produced in, in you know by the effect of steam on the um, on the wood they're not trapped in the chamber but they they just pass out with the tube that you poke out of the window so I normally use it as a follow-up uh, for after pressure steaming. So what, what my schedule will be to bring the temperature slowly up to 150. Now that's pretty well, it takes a long time because of the, well, we get to that. Let's see what the next slide is. It's because of the low en enthalpy is the word, like that's basically its ability to carry heat. So it's the difference between a piece of polystyrene and a piece of metal. So if you if you if you could warm up a piece of polystyrene without melting it, you could uh, a moment later you could touch it. it. It wouldn't have retained any heat, whereas the piece of metal would. So steam at atmospheric pressure really doesn't carry heat. So trying to warm up a big something the size of my tank with um, steam just doesn't work. And, and I tried uh, passing it through a heat exchange device that it was like, you know, about 300 centigrade going into the chamber, such that it charred the wood around where the input pipe is. Uh, but still, I couldn't really get it. I could barely get it to 100 C. So I, I decided that the, that it was essential to heat the, heat the chamber itself. So you could do that. You could do that with heat blankets stuck around the outside. That would be one, one good way. But I decided to do it with heating elements and a fan. So on the left here is the very, very cheap um, heating element for an indesit tumble dryer. So they're about um, 1.2 kilowatts. So I have two of them. And on the right, there's a fan. This is a fan that's designed for use in high temperature environments, such as a, a forge or something like that. I mean, obviously, you can't put it in a fire, but it will, it will take a bit of heat and still keep working. So that's the view. Uh, so it's attached to the lid. 
so you can see the fan and the motors on the other side it, it blows the uh blows the steam down the tube and it comes out the other end effectively getting a really good circulation and then the steam we'll, we'll see it in a picture in a minute and on the right that's my um bodge to make it uh, make the steam flow downwards probably not very very important to do that and there's a picture of the finished object so i've put a nice cage around there so that nobody gets electrocuted and i've covered the wiring with a little stainless steel construction there's a vent that goes out of the window that's just an ordinary thermometer which i broke after a few usages but instead i've got uh, there's also here there's uh, thermocouples connected to this old um, old meter that probably looks like it dates back to the 40s or 50s and here uh, is a um, supermarket well it's a you know diy store uh, steam generator for stripping wallpaper that's very cheap so that puts a current of steam in through what used to be the drain pipe so starting off there's uh i'll start off with a strong current of steam and that expels all the air that's in the container so by the time you get up to near closer temperature there's no there's no air it's all been replaced by steam and then uh, the temperature can gradually go up. But I say the, there's, there's no limit. I could take it up to 200 C if I, if I wanted to wait. You can also just see the variac at the bottom right corner. And that's heavy. There's a lot of copper wire in that. that so that's the place where the um, stuff went in. Steam goes in. And it, inside, I've got... Um, uh, just a little framework uh, to support the pieces of wood, keep them um, away from the bottom of the tank and the sides, so that they they well the circulate the steam circulates well around them. And I think that's it. So I've I've been pretty fast, haven't I? Thank you, George. Excellent. Yeah. So I guess we, we have covered, any, left any questions? We covered in, in the questions. Yeah. So brace yourself. <laughs> well, thank, uh, thank you very much, all, all the panelists. And uh, do we have any questions? Uh, please use the, uh, the, the raise hands feature. Um, any questions? No. Come on. What's in the chat? There must be, the, I think I'm sure there's some questions in the chat. Well, the one question in the chat was, how do you measure um, EMC? You get a meter to do it. What? You can buy a meter. A meter. With a couple of prongs. I don't know how Don Noon does it. Yeah, Don, how do you measure EMC in your experiments? Um, I took some samples of wood and weighed them. Then I put them in an oven at a slightly over 100 C for a while, and I took them out and weighed them again. I oh, think so that's you, uh, actually so you, the process that's uh, used to do that normally. Okay, <laughs> so you directly measured the amount of uh, moisture in in the wood. Yep. Um, okay. <laughs> so I've been. Uh, steaming and boiling wood for the last 20 years and wonder what I'm actually doing. That is, I have one of those giant soup cauldrons. I put a block on the bottom. I put it on, on little heating elements and boil and it fills with steam and the steam all leaks out the lid and I keep adding water. And I do this for about a week. And I think it may, the, the problem I have, well, one question is, what am I actually doing to the wood? And secondly, uh, is uh, cracking, for cracking, especially of spruce, I slather on tons of Elmer's glue every time a crack appears and it stops the cracking, at least for the short run, like 15 years or so. So the question is, what's going on if they just sit in steam for, a week. 
Well, if you read the Yamaha patent, the, the claim is that the free radicals, uh, uh, hydroxide radicals, OH and hydrogen, single hydrogen atoms, but in steam, there's a lot of those available and, and they actually will react with um, things like the hemicellulose and the, uh, and the lignin. Perhaps I don't know what, if it, whether it actually reacts directly with the cellulose itself. But, but also, um, as the when with the effect of heat on the wood, you do generate some acetic acid, which uh, encourages the uh, breakdown of the um, hemicellulose. So that will then go to water and carbon dioxide. But when you do it in a stewing tank, the hemicellulose goes to glucose. So you need to be careful to, to make sure you've washed that out. Otherwise, uh, so impregnating your wood with glucose isn't a great idea because it's rather hygroscopic. Right. Yeah, I got the idea from Otto on the violin in 1834 or something. He said uh, uh, he made a chest uh, 10 feet by 5 feet made of strong boards. This steam by penetrating the spores of the wood softens the vegetable parts and renders them susceptible to being dissolved. The steam is condensed in the chest. In the lower part, liquor at first, but slightly colored, which becomes deeper as the operation proceeds. At length, it is quite clear and tastes very acidic. Hmm. And like could, you, could you scan that and um, post it somewhere where we could find it sometime? Uh, not, not now. Yeah. <laughs> This instant, but but sometime in the future, because that's a, an interesting reference. Yeah. Good. Yes, I'll I will I'll send a copy to Fan, and Fan will take care of it. All right, yeah. uh, I can do that. I think from from what you're doing, I mean, if we just look at what all four of us have have gone over or experienced, there's generally things happen when you heat wood, and it's a bit safer to do it without. Uh, with moisture there and the various scientific papers show that but judicious use of dry baking seems to be fine and as, as Paul has talked about I, I think that um, wood is is very robust and unless you you know you know really start cooking things you're not going to do much and as George said you can tell very well by the color change so if the color is not changing a lot I don't think there's any worry and the old myths that were so um, crippling about oh 50 years from now, it's going to crack or, you know, it won't sound good. It, that's just not based in, in in science or common sense. If it doesn't crack when you treat it, it probably never will. Right. I mean, yeah. it's just... Exactly. I, I found out if it cracks from the start, forget about the piece of wood, you know, and take a good one. Mm -hmm. Other All questions? Right. Yep. yep. We, we do have a... Uh, Sibyl? Um, we have two questions, if that's possible. Um, I'm wondering, George, when you say you did uh, humidity cycling from the start, did you use um, Alan Bevitt's method with uh, using... No, I, I would just um, chuck the wood in, in water for a bit, and then I'll get it well hydrated, and then I'll put it through a cycle of, of dry somewhere. So I have... Uh, I've always worked with a low humidity cupboard, so I have a big cupboard um, that has heaters in it and a um, humid humidistat. So I put it in a in a low, a very low humidity environment uh, for a, a few weeks, mm -hmm. and take it out, and put it in water again for a bit. Okay, repeat. not so not uh, on a finished instrument then. No. No, 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 no. Well, I wouldn't put the I wouldn't want to put the whole violin under water. <laughs> <laughs> Alan Bevitt's method is very interesting. It's rather clever the way he do, does it, using different solutions that control the amount of humidity that comes out. So that, that was cunning, because he has a, a physics background. Uh -huh. hope, he's, hope he's still alive. Um, and there was something Can, else can I ask a question while we're here? Yep, yeah, go ahead. You, you were talking about the vented steam, George, but how do you, how do you get the temperature up when it's not under pressure? Well, uh, the, the steam itself is coming into the container, into the big box at, at 100 C, but yes, then yes. I have the fan that circulates it down that stainless steel tube that I showed you stuck to the yes. lid, 
and in uh, the heating elements are inside that tube. Okay, so so even when it, when it's not uh, under pressure, then you can get the temperature above a hundred. Yes, there's no upper limit to the temperature of steam. Okay, you can set it so it'll char wood instantly. Yeah. Okay, you get yeah, thank it up you. Into thousands, uh, but it's uh, it's very dangerous stuff. You've got to be very careful of superheated steam because yes. it's invisible. So yeah. on ships, they used to use it for moving energy around in very very high pressure steam in big steel pipes and if there were, you could get a leak at a joint or damage thing you could walk past it and it nearly cut you in half or give you yeah. so it's uh, it's something to be careful of be, be aware of the, of the dangers but i don't think with these autoclaves we're not really in that region of that that degree of danger yeah just yeah. um in my opinion okay, thank you thank you yeah. I think that what I'm doing with the, or what we're doing with the, um, the lab oven and, and the drip of water, I mean, by boiling water, you're not gonna get it above boiling point, but when you put it in a hotter environment, it just heats up. So essentially, if you uh, put steam into something that's hotter than steam, it'll just heat up and then excess has to be vented off or else the pressure will build up. Well, it's a gas. So, I mean, you can heat, heat gases up really hot. So mm -hmm. steam, steam likewise can be heated. Next question. Yeah, Jim. Yes, um, I've heard a lot of discussion of, of heating in moist environments, steam, but I haven't heard, heard in this discussion anything about torrefaction, torrefying, which I understand to be heating in the absence of oxygen, like in a, a nitrogen environment, so that you can get it hotter than um, boiling point. Um, but you will not oxidize the lignin. And you, any thoughts about that? You won't oxidize it in a steam environment either. So, so they're almost doing a similar thing in some respects. The study I mentioned earlier on was using, or a couple of them used nitrogen as a, just to make it anaerobic. But I, I agree with George. I think steam is essentially doing okay. that. Plus, it has the benefit that the, the free ions in the steam are, are apparently reactive, according to the Yamaha patent, which I, I'm not really qualified to say how true it is, but um, perhaps there are other people who can comment on that. Claire, for example. I have heard that uh, there's hydrolysis of the hemicellulose, and if you don't have the hydro for hydrolysis, it doesn't do the same thing. So nitrogen would not do the same thing as a steam environment. Steam. Next right. question. Yep, Joseph Najivari. Um, George was the only person I believe who used sodium chloride salt treatment uh, I'm surprised that there was no more interest in this, considering that there are several publications showing that the wood of the Cremonese makers starting with, sorry, that is my iPhone that has to be. Um, so the Cremonese makers starting with Amati had a, a great variety of chemicals in them, just to pour the data for the Guarneri del Gesù. The Guarneri del Gesù violin has uh, about 1,200 parts per million of aluminum, uh, over 6,000 parts per million of calcium. The Stradivari particularly has uh, calcium, but also an extremely high amount of sodium. And there are a dozen other chemicals in them, which were added, were added probably originally for the purpose of, of preserving the wood. So uh, this kind of study would be really very important for you guys to do. Now, I started out 
while I was at Texas A&M University already around 1975, soaking wood with chemicals. And uh, I believe that Sam Zygmunt Tovitz made one of his first violins from the wood that I have soaked with aluminum solutions. Uh, now, if you work with chemicals, you, you have an extremely large variety because you can have many chemical compositions and you, you as a violin maker would not earn a living if you spend your time exploring all those chemicals. So for the past 40 years, uh, with my various associates, we have made at least 250 violins from chemically treated wood. We have some conclusions, but certainly <laughs> not the end of the experiments. The only thing I, I don't know actually if I should uh, say more since I haven't been scheduled. If you are interested, then I will tell you more about it now or on another occasion. But that's, that's a large subject. We, we have soaked wood with different ways of aluminum sulfates, calcium salts, and so on. And um, the chemicals can do to the wood a variety of effects. Uh, and what, what kind of chemicals we use, you know, some of them are hygroscopic, some of them are not hygroscopic. Then we have metals, which can have covalent, which can have ionic bonds, but also coordinate bonds. So it's a rather large topic, really. And I'm not prepared now to, to give any kind of organized uh, presentation about that. Uh, I recommend that you do more, more experiments of your own because these chemicals have a very fundamental effect on the sound of the violins. The major effect is what I can already tell that it, in, they, the, the salts increase the, the magnitude of the air resonance in the spectrum of the violin sound. And I think that's a very important effect that you should explore and you would probably interest in it. There were, um, back in the 80s, there, were, there was a text that was going around that people were talking about that said uh, about the ship's masts were uh, immersed in the uh, lagoon in Venice. So I think that lagoon has a rather higher sal saline content than most seawater yes. evaporating. So there's that. And somewhere else it says that uh, it, musical instruments made from salted wood sounded sweeter. <laughs> the masks were well, made, made the masks more elastic. Now, does that mean it increased the elastic modulus, or does it mean they bent further before they broke? Which now, the seawater, as you know, the seawater again has a complex composition. And the highest amount is, of course, sodium chloride, and that's what you used. And you had some cracks in one of the woods, but the seawater contains also a significant amount of calcium and magnesium salts and those chlorides are very hygroscopic so if you use seawater for example then your spruce would not crack well i don't know i mean uh, there's a difference between a, a hot hot saline solution and a cold one so i mean i don't think they're necessarily going to be do ch chemically equivalent you see what I mean? Well, but my, my experience was that basically that the it it weakened the strength uh, between the you know the parallel grains and crack you know cracks were much more likely. I would um, I would you know agree with Professor Nagivari that it would be great if someone did ex experiments, but the kind of results we want to see are what a very specific treatment and schedule does. So the mechanical and you know parameters of the wood. We don't want to know that it might increase A0 because uh, that's a huge stretch, but does it increase the damping or decrease? It does increase the 
you know, Young's mod, just or and density, all that stuff would be great. Um, I don't know of any convincing studies in that direction, but it would be great to see some. I did some of that, although I wouldn't call it convincing. But uh, early on, I saturated some wood with borax, a borax solution. And for the spruce, it wasn't that easy to get it completely in the wood. I had it in my chamber and did some pressure cycles and then dried it. And I didn't find any change that was very attractive. Then, then I also torrified that wood later. It was just a little bit grayer color than brown, but still I couldn't see any significant difference from the normally torrified wood. So I gave up on that. Thank you. Um, Andy, Ryan, you said you had some experiences to share using um, yeah, yeah. Wait a minute. Let's let, let's just go in turn. We'll, we'll we'll get to it because um, let's sequence this out. Um, first Excuse of all, yeah. um, John Solanika has been waiting patiently. He hasn't found his raised hand, so I'm gonna let John go next. And um... sure. Thanks, Fun. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, so the, I mean, getting down to the 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 brass tacks here, guys. Uh, if you have wood that ranges from a a one quality to a 10 quality. And most of the people on the phone, I think, have the capability and knowledge to choose wood that is from a sort of a nine to a 10 quality. Um, and then you're doing this treatment. What I'm interested in is if you were able to do uh, a number of violins with your high quality wood and a number of violins with your high quality wood having been treated are we moving from something that is just another good violin that a Sigmentovich or a Curtin or others could build, or are we moving from an instrument that, say, Joe could build in his normal wood, or one of Joe's ultralight instruments, which is has this you know magical different uh, set of properties? What I'm what I'm saying is that why don't we just choose good wood and then the violins and build the violins well and then they they're going to sound great. I, does it really make that much of a difference? Is my question. To me, oh. it does. It's very difficult to describe exactly what it is, but to my ear, they sound uh, treated in, wood, uh, instruments made from treated wood do sound different, feel different to play. Uh, but that's not that's not really sufficiently scientific. But uh, but I think. But you can't. But what you can't do is start with crappy wood and turn it into wonderful wood. Oh, absolutely, totally yeah. agree. So you, yeah. you can you start with good wood. Maybe you can enhance it or modify its its behavior in in some way, even if it's increased stability or a bit more color. These are still nice improvements. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I, yeah. I I I agree. It's um I, I think it's it's great for the visuals. It helps a little bit with you know, density, speed of sound. But as you say, we can always get better wood. Um, I've occasionally gone back to an untreated top. I don't think the back makes any difference really. And about the same effects and and um, colleagues um, whose work I respect enormously who haven't treated our wood, you know, they're making fabulous instruments. And so I don't, I don't think we're at the point where we can say anything I mean, except Get it anecdotally, we can get excited and we like using it. And um, one um, thing to th throw in this idea that working it is harder, I don't find it the case. And there's one particular case where treating um, the back wood helps a lot. That's if you ever use aspen or, or light woods, which can be impossibly chewy and fuzzy to a uh, real misery to carve, but you know, they kind of crisp up a bit with the. With the treatment and um, so in that case it's helpful um, but otherwise um, I find the workability of, of the, my wood after treatment which is fairly mild um, just fine if it goes too far it, 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 you know it can get powdery or chippy and but you know you sort of common sense one wouldn't want to put a lot of time into wood that's that's iffy yeah, so um, if if the question, um, people asking the question, can you be patient? Um, let, let's just go to Andrew, since, since Don, you know, brought in that violin, you know, and showed it, and and, and Andrew's um, willing to talk about it. Uh, Andrew? Hey there. Um, I've used a wide range of treated woods from uh, quite mildly uh, processed to 
quite uh, strongly processed. I, I would put Don's at the strongly processed end of the spectrum. Um, first, I've never had a problem in all, all the years that I've been using it with any cracks in any of the processed woods that I've used. I've, I've never had an instrument come in where it, uh, there's a crack from it being processed, uh, never. Um, I'm agree with, with Joe that, that I haven't found it. It can be the really heavily processed, can be a little chippy, um, but basically if you have sharp tools, it's not a problem. Um, the one thing I do I have noticed is that um, the heavier the processing, sometimes the wood can be too strong. Like it, 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 especially if you have, if you start with a piece that's already sort of strong anyways, and you process it, um, it can tend to, for me, from my own work, I should say, it can tend towards being too stiff. Um, that you know maybe you have to leave the arches a little lower than you might want, or a little bit thinner, or um, yeah. Um, visually, it's great. Um, I don't know whether people had any specific technical questions. Uh, right. How you, the wood you've been used is, was treated, or you said you used uh, it uh, which which I've used you... stuff. I've used stuff that I've done in my own oven, so just an oven with a like Joe was talking, the oven and big big pot of water underneath it, and sort of slower processing, sort of over a day. Um, uh, my experience with the, putting the water in, also as opposed to the dry heat. Uh, would be if you if you use dry heat, you, t you run the risk of case hardening the wood, I think, um, and that you'll actually process the outside more than the inside. You can actually sort of harden the outside of the wood as you bake it, um, and the moisture that's inside um, can be trapped. Um, that's my sense of it. I don't know whether that's really true, but th that's where I, that's one of the reasons I like a lot of water in the oven. Um, it just keeps keeps the moist keeps the wood open so to speak um i've used stuff that's processed by um uh, stu mac the guitar people uh and that's sitka spruce that's quite i would say quite heavily processed um so this is where i'm saying the wood can be quite strong because sitka is already can be quite a strong wood it tends to be high density so the, the processing helps lower the density but it can make it quite quite strong um uh i've used stuff that's european wood that's done in a uh, a steam process uh from wood dealers um and then the stuff don used um i would say i like it generally moderately processed i think you can get a lot a lot of benefits from not too much processing and those benefits i think are yeah sure the the weight goes down and the stiffness goes up but i think this stuff with the damping is the more interesting component that the damping can be reduced considerably and i think this ties into how the instruments play differently um they just have a crisper quality in the playing there's a lot of harmonics in the instrument just naturally without even trying to build it into the instrument. I think those components are there. Uh, and the damping may have to do with something in the transients as well, like that the wood is just faster to respond. All right. Thank I've you, made, Andrew. And I've made a... There's just right. one right. thing I forgot to mention about the vented steam is that uh, what I usually do is as I get towards the end of the process, I, I, I back off the steam current to almost nothing. So then you're moving, it's moving towards a dry oven treatment at the end of the cycle. So when you take it out, it's pretty dry. But that's just, just a little technical detail. All right. Thank you. Um, let's go to Alex. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Hi. I just wanted to kind of clarify terms here, is it fair to say that, or is it accurate to say that all of the treatments that we've been talking about, except dry heat, are examples of torrefaction? Um, I don't know who this question is for, but <laughs> um, is torrefaction, 
does that just mean um, heating in an anaerobic environment? My, my understanding is torrefaction was, um, I, I, I could be wrong, but was developed as a wood way of, for completely different reasons. You could um, reduce wood to like something like um, um, coal or for burning processes. It was a way of, um, I think that, or, or right, as, as a way of making, this? it's like the beginning of making charcoal. I think if you went all the way down the exactly. line, you would make biochar, right? Uh, yeah, I so also but, these treatments were also used to to make wood less prone to rot and insect attack and fungal attack. So the, uh, there's a, a part. Of Japan is one of the main sources of the um, papers on this subject, but in Scandinavia as well, because uh, you know. Norway, Sweden, Finland, there's a lot of papers from there about treatments. And I think some, some from Canada as well. So it's, it's industrial use for, for building as well. Yeah, I, I find it reassuring that there's such a vast body of literature and it mostly all points to the same sort of things we're finding, you know, um, applied to their you know, different areas. Um, and um yeah I, um, I you can just google you know any of these almost any of the terms we're talking about and you can start reading articles right away um it's fascinating all right um dimitri good to see you hello thank you and <laughs> good to see you all guys too uh, thanks for sharing a lot. Um, I did research on this and reading articles quite a while ago, so I might mix some things up. But if I remember correctly, and I think George mentioned it, that uh, degradation of hemicellulose brings acidity into the process and the acid harms um, amorphous cellulose and also lignin, as I think George mentioned. So should we keep track of the pH level of the process and how can we do it? Is it maybe good just preventively to, to throw a bit of lye into the tank because lye doesn't seem to do any harm to the wood, at least it's not as much as acidity in my understanding. So how would you monitor pH level yeah, and how would you prevent the acidity excess in the process? I don't know how you monitor the pH level of a gas, but you could um, say in a uh, in an autoclave there is a actually water in it, so you could uh, you could examine the the um, brown residue at the end of a of a treatment. But I, I don't know if there are any devices that will uh, that that can give you a pH reading for a gas. I don't know if it's applicable to a gas. But I think you're right about, I think the um, acetic acid generated is something to be a little bit careful of. So that's perhaps one reason for not having very, very long uh, pressure tr uh, treatments and then uh, uh, moving on to the vented steam, because then uh, the, the acetic acid is, is um, blown away with the excess steam. I do a little bit uh... To try to prevent that, I put a plate with sodium hydroxide on it inside the chamber hmm. during my processing. I don't know how well that might neutralize the acid coming out, but then as a second step, I do the vacuum bake. So it will take off any, uh, any acids that are in gas form. And I also do it at high temperature. That, yes, that should remove it all. It's the idea. You can smell it, can't you? When you take the wood out from an autoclave, it has a very particular smell. Yeah, um, it smells less after I do the vacuum bake. All right, you want to go on? On to the next question, back to Sabiel. Thank you. Um, I was what, surprised that the focus was on the hemicellulose and not on the lignin very much, um, which, which gets quite uh, affected by heat treatment. 
um, and I've always understood it to be a part of the skeleton of the wood. Um, we had some wood sent to a, a outfit in Bathurst, New Brunswick that does torrefaction and uh, it's definitely much stiffer afterwards. But um, yeah, I wonder how much lignin uh, plays into that, into the whole process. I was about to bring up the question of lignin because I don't haven't looked into it very much, but there is some references to heat treatment. Um, it, it certainly affects it. I think it was effectively strengthening it up to a certain point and then quite quickly degrading it. But the, you know, the, I think the degradation started at higher temperatures than we've been talking about. I remember years ago, Oliver Rogers saying that, um, who was um, involved in the pulp and paper in industry as well as being a violin researcher, um, saying that lignin was just incredibly complex. And back then anyway, they still really had no idea of all the things that happened to it. I, the science may have come a long way since then. I don't know, I, I, but I agree. I'd love to know more about it and whether there's something we can tweak in a process that would somehow stabilize it, harden it. Um, well, we, we know it's damaged by alkalis because that's how you make wood pulp is you use cost, uh, put the um, pulp in uh, caustic soda and uh, then you basically reduce, you take away all the bonding. And, mm. A, a, a mush of bits of fiber so def, definitely strong alkalis are that's why immersing it in ammonia is such a bad idea um, mm -hmm. but it is also said that it, it does oxidize in the air over the over time anyway and it will do it faster at higher temperatures but whether or not what we're doing is hot enough and long enough to really be a problem i don't know It'd be good to know, but as I say, I don't, I don't. Mm. But, I, I, and but I'm careful to, to try and make sure that I'm not doing something that I think will damage the lignin. Another thing that would be good to know is I came across a reference to hemicellulose, which can itself can also crystallize. And I wonder on what under what conditions it does that. And, and if that were the case, we could somehow get it to crystallize along with the rest of the cellulose rather than stepping out of the, the picture, um, just a thought. Well, I think it'll only be the higher molecular weight heavy cellulose that will do that. So basically the that stuff we want to keep anyway, because that's important. The, the stuff we're prepared to lose is the low molecular weight stuff. Is that what will be lost most quickly in, in our process? Yes. Okay, yeah. good. It'll, what happens to it depends on the conditions. So it's spontaneously, in, it, over time, it will break down into um, water and carbon dioxide. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's, uh, the loss uh, is about 1% per century. So you've got to wait a long time for that to happen. <laughs> Next question. Jim? Uh, yeah, uh, two observations. One is that I have heard you know, that the uh, um, treatment that old Italian instruments may or may not have been subjected to makes them impervious to insect damage. Um, but in contrast to that observation, you, you go to the Paris Conservatory Museum, you will see a beautiful strad that is riddled with worm damage. So um, it probably was not impervious to in insect damage. Uh, the other thing uh, I was going to say is, yeah, I also have had lengthy discussion with Oliver Rogers about lignin, who basically said, just said that it's very complex stuff. But one thing I can say about lignin, just from my own experience, is that I believe that it, in the original, the way that it comes out of the tree is it's, it's a rather thermoplastic material, which means that if you heat it, it becomes um, soft, um, and that's why you can bend wood, but repeated heating makes it be trans become more of a thermal set material that doesn't change with heat. And that's why when you want to bend a piece of wood, the best chance you have is the first time. If you try it again, it becomes very hard to bend. Um, and that's because the lignin has 
transformed into a more thermoset material. Fascinating. And so our, our heat treatments probably are not helping us with rib bending. No. Okay. Better to bend them first than treat them. <laughs> yeah, that would work. No, that actually is not is not is not stupid. Hmm. Um, All right. So um, build a um, seven string bass vial that we made out of five bent staves to make up the top. So I was planning to do that. I was planning to um, put them in superheated steam um, when they come right up and got them bent enough to clap to a former of some kind. But anyway, I haven't done it yet. I'll, I'll let you know how it come, works out. Yep. Yeah, but the glue, the glue doesn't resist the temperature. I think you're gonna have, no, uh, you have pieces of, of I have five separate pieces. I, I couldn't do it glued. No, but, but if you ever need to get a top undone, put it in steam and it will come up hot straight away. All right, um, Dorian. I see Dorian working hard, <laughs> hearing bows in the bit. <laughs> yes, bass bows, yay. Um, uh -huh. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for this, uh, this Zoom. This has been wonderful. And thank you to everybody that's uh, been willing to share their experiences, what they've gone through, what not to do. That's always very helpful. Um, I was curious about, um, we talked about differences of using um, seawater or salted water and not if if is there any is there any is is one kind of water any better but like distilled versus uh, i have home filtered water that even puts some minerals back in for flavor versus city water that you know has high uh bleach uh chlorine and, and, and chlorinates in it um is there and also a lot of metals i think in city water but um is there any um, choice that you guys that use the water uh, use? I like Perrier water. <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> no, I, I think if you're if how it's much is be... that to fill a cello tank with, there, Joseph? <laughs> um, but if it's going to be steam, it doesn't matter because the you know the, the the solids will be left behind. Um, if you're if you are boiling it in something, I suppose you need to be more careful. But usually, the I would think the contaminants are. Um, um, very small amounts, um, but respecting what what George has said about pH values, I, I would imagine um, if you wanted to explore um, boiling, it might not be more careful. Um, I think I, I think I've always just used tap water. I found some interesting things, though, although. Um... Lignin is seriously damaged by al alkalis. One exception is if you use a, a silicate, a potassium, potassium silicate uh, in the water, uh, that actually doesn't, doesn't make the wood fall apart. No, that, that's interesting. So it has interesting reactions with things like glue, for example. You can't mix glue size with a, a, a silicate because the glue will just precipitate out. So Although it's alkaline, I think it somehow re refuses to dissolve certain things. So that, that's a curiosity. Mm. Um, so potentially, the, I mean, that could impregnate it with uh, something that will actually stiffen the wood. But on the hand, at the same time, you're into that situation where you're adding material. Uh, and is that is that going to improve wood or is it simply going to increase the density? Don't know. It's pretty hard to beat wood yeah. with the stiffness to weight ratio with any added stuff. I, I agree com completely. I mean, if you just look at the the you know the Young's modules of almost anything you can add, it's going to be way below what wood is for for you know for its weight. Yeah. There are a couple of ways to take matter out of wood without heating it. Uh, one is to soak it in things like acetone or other uh, volatiles that dissolve things in it. And I think the it was the Tibetans or somebody who put water, uh, put wood in cold water in a stream for a year and that leached out bad stuff or something. I had no idea, but uh, in, I think a guitar maker said soaking wood in acetone really improved the tone. Don't know if anyone else had experience with that. I, I wouldn't. Um... 
when a sentence ends with improve the tone, I, 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 I'm su suspicious. <laughs> I know that um, um, what we're talking about removing, I think, is what's called extractives. And I don't think they're very high in um, spruce and maple anyway, if you're looking at some of these oilier um, um, woods, tropical woods that perhaps are of interest to um, guitar makers, that might be a, an additional consideration. But as there's as not as much as comes out of maple and spruce. Acetone will dissolve things like resins, but not heavy cellulose. Um, Thank you. Well, Jim's got another question. Or comment. Um, well, you mentioned extraction, and um, extraction essentially happens naturally over time with moisture cycling. Um, if you um, have a piece of fresh cut wood, it has an aroma, and that aroma consists of molecules of something that leave the wood and get into the air. Um, and if you then, so you dry the wood and, and it gives off some moisture and then it picks up, you re-moisturize it, but whatever left the wood doesn't come back when, you, when it gets wet again. And several moisture cycles, well, something has gone away that will never come back. And I think that something that has gone away is mostly hemicellulose, which is, uh, you know, they're sugar compounds that are soluble. Um, so moisture cycling probably makes the wood more stable because um, that um, something that goes away it doesn't come back. Um, the um, uh, process, there's a, a, I'm trying to say the wood, um, 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 the te technical term has escaped me for the moment, but essentially um, wood shrinks and swells. Um, sor sorption hysteresis is the uh, term I was searching for. Wood shrinks and swells with the gain and loss of moisture, but it doesn't do so completely symmetric. Um, when you dry a piece of wood and then re-moisturize it, and I've done this, um, and measure the width of the piece of wood and the weight of it and, and go back and forth a few times, it will shrink a certain amount and then it will regain, but it will not completely regain the width it once had. It will never come back all the way. So um, it becomes more stable, more resistant to cracking and shrinking and swelling over time just by moisture cycling. And that I think is mainly because of that loss of um, hemicellulose. That's my observation. I think the EMC content is, is lower after a lot of humidity cycling. Yeah. Yeah. Is the word, you're looking for something like hysteresis. I mean, that's used mostly used in mechanical situations, but it's like a, a kind of range that something can be in. Yeah. In, in... But of course, existing instruments get moisture cycled over time. And if, if you see a lot of old bases, which I certainly have, um, um, that have had lots of cracks, which they almost always do. Um, well, you cannot possibly close those cracks and have the wood be as big as it once was. Um, that, and you see that in old violins. Um, uh, many of them, you know, the Cremonese method was that um, the lower and upper ribs were made in one piece from corner to corner. Um, but you, many of those have had the lower rib cut to at the um, end block in order to shorten them slightly. And that's because the, the top and especially the back have become permanently narrower than when they were new. And that's probably because moisture cycling happened naturally over time. 
Yeah, so definitely better to do that as much of that as you can before you build the instrument. Yeah, absolutely. It make it go through a lot of moisture cycle before you make it into an instrument, and then it's not going to have to do it so much. Or um, just treat treat it in a way that does the same thing. I mean, absolutely. Yeah, it, mm -hmm. I, I think that's a I major added, advantage. I I had a violin that came back in the workshop that I made a few years ago. Uh, and I took the exact measurements of violin, and that was a, a violin I made with a treated wood, um, you know, like baked 170 degrees, so quite high temperature, and uh, it's it's actually very very stable for uh, for what, all what is neck setting and all this. It's the wood doesn't really move, but as you said, uh, after six years, it shrank for about one millimeter of the table and the and the back, so it's even with a treated wood, you know, and quite strong treatments, but the woods shrink after, you know, six years or something. So um, it, it, it's, 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 the, the violin moves after, I don't know if it's because of the, of the, of the tension of the, of the strings and the, and the tension of the instruments, but um, the wood shrinks for sure. Are, are you sure it's the wood shrinking or just the measurement across getting smaller because the arching gets deformed? Uh, I think it's both, it's both because uh, now I measure all direction and it was really getting, getting smaller. Yeah. Okay. Well, certainly um, wood shrinking, um, uh, never mind the arching, um, causes cracks um, as best exemplified by the traditional way of making a flat back base, which is with braces glued at right angles to the length of the grain of the back, and they 100% always crack. And that's <laughs> <laughs> they, they, um, also, they also go and, concave, don't they? Which is doesn't look yes, so they do. That's yeah. they Hence for the, the same reason. The of the process, yeah. and so you know, that's been one of my things that I've advocated is don't build a base that way. It, it, you know, they, the old makers didn't do everything right to begin with, and we shouldn't copy their mistakes. I always make the bars a little bit convex. because um, they, Yeah, but they, there's two different ways to make it convex, yeah. which make a big difference. Mm -hmm. If you can put some curve in the bar and 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 force the wood against that curvature and it'll make it a bit convex and that helps a bit but if you do it instead by pressing the wood against a curved counterpart forcing the bar into it it will then put the uh, back under compression mm -hmm. um it which means that as it shrinks the the compression is reduced instead of the tension is increased um mm -hmm. So those two different ways of pre-stressing baseballs in similar that, ways. Exactly. Yeah. All right. Let's let's have one last uh, question or comment from Joseph Dajuari, and then uh, because we're past the two-hour point. Oh, you're muted. I just have a comment that relates to what. James Ham mentioned that concerns the stability of hemicellulose. A hemicellulose is a long molecule which has a shape, a chain which is like a spiral more or less, and it has a function of serving as an internal glue. Chemically, Hemicellulose does not degrade very easily, but the main degradation is by hydrolysis. So the longer chain can eventually break down to smaller pieces. And by this process, it loses the function of being a glue. And that explains why shrinkage and eventually cracks can develop. Uh, hemicellulose does not ev uh, evaporate on drying and oxidation to carbon dioxide and water is an extremely slow process. 
you, you find a lot of hemicellulose in 500-year-old uh, samples of wood. And my friend uh, H.C. Tai in Taiwan has analyzed them for hemicellulose. And they have still a relatively high hemicellulose content. Thanks for coming. Well, I, I was never suggesting that the hemicellulose all goes away, but a little bit of it does with each moisture site. You definitely don't want it all to go away, for sure. No, definitely not. The strength of the wood, but uh, some of the some of the low molecular weight stuff that's more hygroscopic, you know, it's okay to lose. You well, and also I I think it's a mistake to think that hemicellulose is one thing. It's yes. Um, Right. And so the the probably you know the aroma that you're smelling is probably the more soluble fraction of it. It's probably part of the way that wood actually loses elastic modulus as it gets very old. So if uh, the heavy cellulose chains, some of the big ones are breaking, um, mm -hmm. that's losing losing quite a lot of strength eventually. Well, to my knowledge, heavy cellulose itself does not have a noticeable smell. Uh, pine and spruce trees smell because of the terpene materials in them. You know, these are the, the resinous materials which have definitely a smell. Mm -hmm. And they evaporate from old wood or polymerize to the point that you don't smell it clearly. And are those resins, um... Are they sort of coating the cell walls or, or how are they distributed? Or are they just in they, narrow channels? They, and they interact with, with the lignin. They are ah. the, the aromatic hydrophobic part of the wood uh, binds the nonpolar terpene molecules, sesquiterpenes, and the rosin itself is a polymer of, uh, of the monoterpene. So they are in interaction with, with, the, with the lignin, and you can extract them by acetone. So certain amount of, I don't know exactly how many percent, it depends on the kind of spruce, but a few percent of terpenes you can extract with any kind of organic solvent, alcohol, acetone, benzene, and so on. Probably I'm not sure that this extraction actually benefits the Young's modulus of the wood. If you extract them, all of them, maybe actually it's not helpful. Joseph, um, any concluding remarks? I was just said last thing, I was going to say, in, in the very low density type of wood we often choose for, for tops, there's probably not very much uh, in the way of terpenes in that. But you think it's there's always going to be some as part of the structure of the wood. Definitely the high. I mean, spruce density varies a great deal. The lowest density I worked with was 0 0.33. And the highest density, uh, I still haven't made a violin, 0 0.45. Oh. And none of the Sadivari violins have density above 0 0.4. So I really probably would not prefer a high density spruce, but the high density spruce is high density because it has a lot of organic material and a lot of, lot of terpenes in them, more acceptable ah. in them. Mm. Well, um, are we approaching the end of the formal part? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. So, well, first, thank you so much, um, um, George and Paul and Don for sharing what you know. I, I super appreciate that. And um, I, um, um, actually, I, a quick question to anyone. I mean, how, how nervous are people about talking about this subject in public? Is there still a stigma? I, I, I don't know. Any show of hands or um, anyone give me a sense of that? Well, I don't know what we're showing hands for. Are we <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, saying? I'm, but I, I do think uh, a huge problem with the discussion of both wood treatment and and varnish, which we talked about maybe doing in the future, is that people who have 
found things to be successful for them don't necessarily want to talk about that. Um, and so I'm really in favor of as much sharing as possible. I, I, I agree, of course, and I think a lot of people who are successful might attribute their success to some choice of varnish ingredient or wood treatment and reality. Um, just like many medical procedures, they're not really, <laughs> the results are only distantly related to the, you know, the procedures. The majority of people who've listened to this um, session won't, won't start treating their wood. I think Dor Dor Dorian wants to say something. Just a side note, Joseph, I came and visited your shop back in the late 90s. I and remember. you took and toured me and showed me your, your cool sound post fitting get, uh, machine and all this cool stuff. And then we walked by this pile of wood and you said, oh, and I just got that pile of wood back from treatment and I'm not going to talk about that. And we just moved on from there. So thank you for opening up. Yeah, I've I've been, I think, I'm completely open about almost everything, but wood treatment, there were people, you know, who would, you know, were actively, you know, bad mouthing that sort of thing. And, uh, you know, it's, um, it's a sorry thing in any profession when that happens. Um, but I, I, I hope we're we're past that professionally, and and I mean, there's overwhelming bodies of evidence I think to show that we don't have to worry about surprises happening way down the line. So if we get the wood where we want it now, we can be pretty confident it'll just age in the normal way. So um, my my vote for everyone is is talk about it as vigorously as possible, and let's just normalize it, and hopefully we can each of us distill the best of what works for ourselves and and keep moving. So. Um, thank you, everyone. Um, stick around and, and and chat. All right. Thank you. All right. So um, thank you, everyone. And um, if you want to stay around and just chat on any topic, you know, we're, we're moving on to the